Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I accidentally hit uh, stop on the prior record, which I'll post. So today's lecture will be in two parts, and I promise I won't take more than uh, 10 minutes to finish up. So I was on stupa, uh, explaining that the stupa is categorically a cylindrical uh, dome-shaped structure, uh, can be dome-shaped or cylindrical, uh, erected uh, really as a shrine. Um, and uh, I was ex extrapolating on the term dagoba, which is a pagoda tiered tower, which we're going to see a fine example of, probably one of my favorites um, in, in the Chinese architectural lecture series, um, a, uh, a pagoda tiered tower with multiple eave lines. Uh, this one is not in China, but this would be more cylindrical in nature, uh, cylindrical in nature, uh, dome shaped uh, in nature. I would describe this one as uh, another good example of a dome shaped stupa. Uh, and a uh, cast concrete stupa. <coughs> this is the plan of the Forbidden City that we were looking at earlier. I should emphasize the book points out a couple of things with respect to, uh, specifically with the Forbidden City, is the use in Chinese architecture of repetition of number and sequence. So three, five, and nine are commonly used numbers. And you can kind of read this thing and do a close read of this thing and find uh, you know, three, five, and nine uh, all over the place. You can see kind of three uh, stairways that um, allow you to enter upon uh, the upper level or the central level, the Palace of Divine Harmony, uh, three levels that you're crossing to get up to this level. Uh, you can see here in kind of the niche format, one, two, three. Uh, you see here one, two, three, four, five, with really a sixth shortened bay of three. Uh, if that's not clever enough yet for you, so five column bays, five column bays, five column bays, five column bays, five column bays in five niches, and then the sixth one drops down to three. Um, you enter here from the middle uh, in a, uh, a line of uh, four interior columns to your right, four interior columns to your left, uh, two lines of interior columns, and then one, well, really three lines of interior columns, and then one line of uh, columns that dot the colonnade on the front side, and then two that line on the back side, forming the number five. So, you know, you can kind of do a close reading here and uh, see what the book is emphasizing about uh, the rep repetition of the number three, five, and nine in Chinese architecture. This is a really, really good view of the Hall of, let me get it right, Hall of Supreme Harmony. Um, we see again the use of the, uh, of the dugong here, which is kind of mitigating between the vertical and the horizontal, um, the sweeping eave line of the pagoda roof, double tiered in this case. We're going to see an example here at the end of a triple tier. Also remember this symbol. And again, if any of you uh, speak or understand Chinese, please tell me what this says, because I think it's, it's the same thing that we're going to see on, um, on the uh, Dasi Hall, which we'll end on here today. Uh, use of color. Uh, I emphasize also in this slide the um, the certainly high level of detail and craftsmanship exhibited in the main building, but also the secondary site elements are not to be uh, um, an afterthought. I mean, just look at the amount of detailing that you see here in the balustrade or the guard wall, uh, the guardrail walls. Uh, with the vertical column separation in between and the detailing here in the openings, even at the very bottom, the kind of the flood line of the stone wall, uh, heavily articulated uh, here in the center and really no detail is, is not thought through um, here. Coffered ceiling, not a new term to you, but in this format, this may be a unique look for what we've seen so far in terms of coffered ceiling, but really in terms of its taxonomy or vocabulary, it's really no different than uh, the coffered ceilings that we've looked at. It's just now um, uh, has a Chinese cultural quality to it in terms of the architecture. Uh, this is the interior of the, um, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. Okay, here, this is the exemplary image of the dugong that I wanted to, that I mentioned earlier that I referenced that we'd be seeing in the in subsequent slides. So here uh, we're seeing kind of an expression of peeling away of the plane of the corner and building building out three levels um, from the, the the planes of the of the column itself. Um, and the craftsmanship is there. There's a high level of um, articulation. 
of shaping and forming these wood blocks that make up the dugong. But also, it's not, uh, it doesn't end there. They also treat the surface as basically a canvas for, uh, you know, for an artist uh, to display color and pattern. So really, this is a, uh, this is a place where uh, Chinese architects really like to uh, take creative license and really express the Chinese uh, characteristic of the architecture in the dugong. Uh, three-dimensional for sure. It doesn't stay flat like we saw in the first couple examples. We're basically starting to explore. The Chinese are the first ones to really take on the corner as a as a kind of a problem architecturally. Well, we we won't see it, but in in contemporary architectural theory, there are architects that take on this this idea. Peter Eisenman is one uh, as an example. If you guys are interested or want to read up, but like, what is the role of the corner in architecture? This is a uh, a space where architects do a lot of kind of design and thinking uh, about the role of the corner. And I would say the Chinese are the first ones that are basically kind of starting to peel away the surface. So the corner is thought of as an edge where kind of two planes come together, right? So, it, you know, you could say it starts on the outside or starts on the inside, ends on the outside or vice versa. But really, it, it, it's, it's only as deep as the surface of the two materials coming together, which is... I guess in modern terms or in contemporary terms, it might be a six inch or an eight inch wall. Uh, in uh, olden, olden times, it may be a two or a three foot wide wall, but it's not something that really is 10 feet deep. The Chinese, by basically pulling the dugong out, are really peeling the corner away and continuing the story really longer than it traditionally um, has uh, has given it more surface area than it traditionally has. Uh, they're basically saying, yes, this is the corner and we're actually celebrating the corner and we want to draw more attention to it. And we don't want it to just end where those two surfaces come together. As it moves up, we want to kind of build the, the surface out a little bit. Uh, and you can read into that as much as you want. Maybe there's something about kind of uh, extending the building uh, a little bit more to kind of bring you in or... Um, uh, mediate the gap. Actually, we'll see in Dossie Hall right now, uh, use of the eave line below the fascia uh, and how um, uh, they are, the Chinese architecture really likes to fill in that space and treat that space as um, a place for um, uh, architectural uh, display. Showing off, for lack of a better term. This is, I include this slide because this is an interesting project that an architect did. I don't know if the architect himself or herself was Chinese, but this is an installation done, which is um, basically built based on the, the inspiration is the Chinese dugong. But what the architect did here is took the idea that's generally reserved to uh, the transition zone between a vertical and a horizontal as articulate as, that, as it might be, that's generally where the dugong lives. And in this case, the architect has taken the dugong and taken inspiration from the Chinese dugong and actually made it a wall plane. Uh, I think this is um, a really interesting uh, project and installation uh, based on the dugong as an inspiration. Okay, Tiantan. Uh, Tiantan, I'm not sure if it actually means, uh, the book refers to Tiantan as the altar of heaven. There's also another term, uh, Jianjing. Again, I don't speak Chinese. If any of you are fluent in Chinese or know Chinese and can tell me if Jianjing means altar of heaven or Tiantan maybe means altar of heaven. Nonetheless, this is Tiantan also in Beijing, also built by um, Yongle, Emperor Yongle, and also built in the same time period that he's building the Forbidden City, 1406 to 1420, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 1406 to 1420. So same time period, builds both of these uh, uh, masterworks of, of Chinese architecture. Um, and uh, so we're going to kind of move through one, two, three series of buildings here, which are uh, the vault of the earthly mount, the palace of abstinence in the middle, uh, and then Dasi Hall is where we'll end on the back. And I promise, I, I said 10 minutes, I'm already at 9.33. I'll try to finish in the next three or four minutes. Um, so the use of the circle and the square, uh, the book says, is seen to represent in Chinese um, culture, the circle heaven 
and the square earth. So this is what you're looking at here, which is the altar of heaven, the vault of heaven, I'm sorry. <coughs> Pardon me. At the vault of heaven, you're seeing basically this three-tiered podium. It's an open space. It's not really a building, architecturally speaking. Um, and it's built as a place for sacrifice because we're higher up above the ground plane. We're theoretically closer to God. Uh, and, and, you know, God can hear us better when we're closer is the idea. Uh, and this is a place where they would have come to make sacrifice, to say thanks for the bountiful harvest um, and to pray and to, to say thanks and to pray for, you know, continuation of, um, of, of, of rain and of good weather so that next season can be uh, just as bountiful, if not more, uh, so that we can uh, eat and thrive. Uh, alas, a circle, a circle within a square, square representing the earth. Um, there's a close-up view of it, so three tiers moving up from the center. Actually, all four cardinal points give you access to this top tier. You can kind of move back down and back through the gates to and on to the palace of... I'm sorry, I don't have a close-up slide of palace of abstinence. Uh, I really wanted to end on this, which is my favorite uh, work of Chinese architecture, uh, which is this building, Dasi Hall. So three-tiered dogba. Um, you see the pagoda roof profile in all three tiers. You see a lot of amazing things here. Um, the I want to call your attention a little bit to the fascia, which is not an important term if you, you know, to remember right now. But fascia is effectively the end of the roof line. And so if you were to kind of imagine the continuation of that circle, that would that would give you a circle. So that would have a diameter. You compare that to the diameter of the fascia line above, it should be obvious to all of us that the upper level has a diameter that's smaller than the middle diameter, which has a diameter that's smaller yet than the diameter of the lower portion. So that's interesting, probably onto itself, but we're going to uh, read a little bit deeper. Um, I suppose I should first call your attention to the building out of the five, I believe it's five, one, two, three, four, five layers of um, dugong filling in the depth of the eave line at the upper level. Uh, similar at the middle level, but modulates down from five to looks like three, but still filling in that, that space, basically treating that space between the wall of the tholobate and the eave line, the fascia line, as a canvas for architectural expression. Uh, and then here in the middle, deeper yet than the shallowest, which is at the low point. A couple of things I want to draw your attention to that are maybe a little bit more detail and specific. So the depth of the eave line is actually increasing as we move up, even though the fascia and the diameter of the roof line is actually decreasing as we move up. And they're not even decreasing at the same increment or they, the, the, they're not, the change in the dimension is not even directly inverse of the change in dimension of the other. Rather, even that is changing in proportion. What I mean by that, I want to call your specific attention to this. So let me take a moment to kind of express what I'm saying here. If we take the eave line of the lower section and we project the line up and we take the eave line of the middle section and project the line up and measure this dimension and call it X between this vertical line and this vertical line, that would be X. Let's just call that X. If we were then co to compare it with the vertical extension of this middle tier plane of the tholobate, with the bottom tier of the tholobate projected up, that would be X plus. Uh, maybe even X at this level. It would be close, but I don't believe they're exactly the same. But what I know my eye is telling me for sure is that when I get to the upper level and I project the line vertical on the middle tholobate and I compare that to the line of the upper tholobate, I know for sure that that dimension is wider than the difference here between this eave line and this eave line. So what's happening is the tholobate is decreasing. The eave line is also decreasing, 
but the tholobate is decreasing at a faster pace, which is basically allowing the depth of this Eve line to also modulate up in terms of depth as you move from the bottom to the top. I think that's fascinating. There's so many things fascinating about this project. The, the, the way the roof tiles are arranged just sort of uniformly and perfectly really emphasize the curvature. So look closely, do a kind of a close read. I, I should say, I, I'm, I'm really impressed with the, um, with the exam responses. You guys are actually doing really well on doing close reading, but you know, why not build on that? And why not, you know, push you to, to continue to read, uh, do, uh, get more in depth in terms of what you're reading architecturally. So this is, I guess, kind of a, a moment or an example of, uh, a closer reading of something architecturally that I want to encourage you guys to continue doing as you are. Uh, and, and by the way, this was also on the uh, Hall of Supreme Harmony. So again, if any of you know what this says or what the meaning of this is, please, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, learning. But the by aligning these roof lines and not changing, altering as you, as you know, as we move up, uh, effectively what this means is they built the roof line in lines moving up towards the center rather than the way this would traditionally be done is you would build the first line then you would build the second line then you'd build the third line and you'd kind of move up in concentric rings if you do that you're not always going to get these tiles lining up in the perfect vertical pattern that it does when we do that when you line the tiles coming down this from in a perspective uh, view, which is what this is, we're looking at this building in perspective. In perspective view, it's starting as a vertical surface and it's transitioning to almost a, a flat surface. But really, because we're looking at this building three dimensionally, we're going to see these as lines that basically project vertically down the center of this building. And what that's doing is that's emphasizing, I think, the radial quality by giving it this kind of fanning effect, um, which is also working in conjunction with, with the dugong, I think really well. These lines are kind of bringing our eye down and then the dugong actually brings our eye back to uh, the symbology and the amazing uh, kind of artisanal craft work, even in the uh, expression of the wall plane of the tholo bait. I have a couple of images of it, and honestly, I just want to kind of stop there and let you take it in. I think it's the I think it's the 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 circular quality of it. I think it's the repetition of the circle of the roof line emphasized and consistent with the repetition of the circular quality of the the, the base of the building. Um, that just I don't know. There's a to me there's a sublime sublime quality to it, and I think probably the color has a lot to do with it as well. <coughs> um, Oh, one bit of housekeeping. I think you uh, probably received already. I think I got an email Monday asking me to just announce and encourage you all to take the surveys of the course, uh, the content, the format of uh, myself, my teaching methods, etc. If you haven't already done that, please do that. Uh, fill out the survey. I know the administration and, uh, and the university really appreciate the student feedback. Um, so uh, I don't know what format that came in. I'm guessing probably an automated email. So if you haven't already done that, please do that. Um, and, uh, and that's all I have. So thank you.